the horseshoe crab, or as it's scientifically known, Limulus. It is one of the most intensely studied marine invertebrates in the world. A native to the shallow waters off the New Jersey shore, at a glance, the horseshoe crab may not appear to be much more than a throwback to a prehistoric era. With a host of hitchhikers clinging to its shell, its slow-moving, docile nature further lends to the misconception that horseshoe crabs are nothing more than a distant echo of a forgotten world. But what many people don't know is how integral a role the horseshoe crab plays in our world today. Horseshoe crabs are being exploited on virtually every level, putting them in the center of much controversy. Due to the competing and sometimes conflicting uses of horseshoe crabs, population and preservation have become a major issue, which is why the Ocean Institute on Sandy Hook has developed a program dedicated to educating people on the importance of horseshoe crabs. I'm Dave Grant, and the Ocean Institute is part of community development at Brookdale, and we do the non-credit uh, portions of what we do here at Sandy Hook. Dave Grant has been the director of Brookdale Community College's Ocean Institute for over 20 years. He starts to have stuff growing all over him because he's no longer shedding. Now he's an artificial reef or a living reef. Can you see the slipper shell here? He has studied horseshoe crabs extensively and has written numerous articles concerning the impact they have on their environment, including an educational workbook that provides an all-encompassing look at limulus, including their biology, the crucial role they play in the food chain, their commercial uses, and the necessity of preserving these valuable resources. Big enough to produce eggs. And they, they produce eggs, mm -hmm. a lot of these three sea creatures, according to the water yeah, temperature. Pull them off that hurt. And okay. they, they're filter feeders. Does it bother them or hurt them? Well, we're giving you an article on that. Here at uh, Sandy Hook, the, the college uh, handles about 12,000 visitors a year. Uh, many of them come down for uh, one day trips. Uh, others uh, come down for credit courses. We also have uh, various uh, curriculum activities for uh, teachers related to horseshoe crabs, and we have our estuaries and watershed curriculum, and we also have a, a, a booklet on uh, Sandy Hook for teachers who want to visit here. And our wetlands protection uh, uh, manual that we uh, co-developed with National Audubon Society. Um, so we've got things pretty well covered from the beaches up to the mountains and from cradle to coffin uh, with uh, all age groups here. The Ocean Institute also hosts other educational programs dealing with horseshoe crabs. Today we're lucky enough to have uh, the folks from Delaware who've developed a Green Eggs and Sand project, educational project for teachers to teach them not just about horseshoe crabs but about the, the uh, resource value of the crab uh, what it's used for uh, in the fishing industry, and uh, a little bit about the politics of uh, how that, that particular resource is managed. And the global link uh, that horseshoe crabs give us between uh, New Jersey and uh, both of the poles, uh, the shorebirds and, and uh, uh, several species of shorebirds that migrate between the Arctic and almost the Antarctic and rely on the uh, horseshoe crab eggs for food. Green Eggs and Sand is an organization based out of Delaware, Maryland, and New Jersey. Their workshops focus on training teachers on how to instruct their students on the importance of horseshoe crabs through a series of educational games and activities. Such as this game that takes students through the process of horseshoe crab spawning. This activity will show how factors like wind and weather can prevent horseshoe crabs from laying their eggs and will give students a good idea of how delicate the spawning process actually is. Down there somewhere. My name is Gary Kramer. I'm a coordinator of aquatic education for the state of Delaware. And I'm part of a team of educators from the state of New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland who have developed a, a unique educational project uh, and workshop experience and curriculum centered on the horseshoe crab and shorebird 
phenomenon and man management controversy. Uh, we started in the year 2000 and we've been doing workshops during, tied in with the spawning season of the horseshoe crabs each year for the past four years. This year, there was such interest that we had in the last several years from way beyond the three states, teachers from over a dozen states, waiting lists of educators to uh, come into the workshop, that we decided as a team that we would do some road workshops. We'd take green eggs and sand on the road and we're doing three workshops up and down the coast. We did one up in Cape Cod. Um, we'll finish with one in, in Virginia at the end of the spawning season. And this is our second one this spring up here in Sandy Hook. So um, we had hooked up with uh, Dave Grant at Brookdale College Ocean Institute at uh, a workshop a couple years ago that he came to. And uh, we talked about um, coming up here and, and doing a workshop here, or particularly to was a, a lot of our teacher interest came from the state of New Jersey, the ones that have been coming over to Delaware, so it was an opportunity to um, bring, uh, bring the workshop here uh, to, uh, to a new, new batch of teachers that uh, we hope would take the, uh, what they learned from the workshop and the curriculum and the activities that we have back and teach their students about it. So at the end of it, by playing the game after they get through this, they have a good idea of the different variables and things and conditions that are important to uh, spawning. My name is Sue Bennett Canelli. I'm with the New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife. I'm the Aquatic Education Coordinator for New Jersey. I came into Green Eggs and Sand in, I believe it was 2000. It has been amazing. It's, the, it's been so well received and like Gary said, the support that we've gotten from experts in the field, their reaction to it, the response to it, and the response of the public in general has been overwhelming and has really made the curriculum what it is today. And it's just been phenomenal to watch it grow and to have those people come in and be a part of the workshop and have the experts be blown away by the type of material that's presented. It's just been so exciting and it's a wonderful group of people to work with, not just the biologists, um, but the educators as well. Everybody's really put their heart and soul into it and you can really tell. Sometimes the crepidula is smart. Look where it is. And particularly here, if the water is coming... An absolutely critical part of the, probably the mo one of the most important parts in, about the Green Eggs and Sand workshop and project is that we rely heavily on experts such as Dr. Schuster, shorebird people, biomedical people, fishermen. Uh, we bring in all the different players in the horseshoe crab shorebird controversy. In pumping water, the book gills, of course, are moving this way. The water comes in through what I call the inhalant canal or channels on either side of the two pieces. And the water goes in, and you'll note that on the base of the hind legs is a, looks like a little scapula paddle. And that's right in the in-current or ex-current channel, it depends on which way the animal's pumping the water at that time. It, it probably, modulates or influences or directs the current of water. Carl Schuster, we can't say enough about him. He really is truly a world authority on horseshoe crabs and marine life. I could tell you whether it was a male or female because the juveniles all look like females. And, and the essence is that when you look at the rim, it gets wider as it comes forward in the female and juveniles. In the male, it gets narrower. Well, that seems to be part of the engineering scheme of things because in the male, it has a deep arch and it overrides the female. It's almost like the same adjustment, uh, uh, adaptive uh, feature that you find in turtles. It's, it's really a great privilege uh, to have him come and share his knowledge with uh, the college and uh, New Jersey teachers today. And so we're, uh, I just can't tell you how delighted we are to have him aboard. Dr. Schuster from the Virginia Institute School of Marine Science and the College of William and Mary has dedicated much of his life to the preservation and study of Limulus. In recognition of his contributions, the sanctuary off the mouth of Delaware Bay was named the Carl N. Schuster Jr. Horseshoe Crab Reserve in 2001. I was encouraged all the way through my training to not become a, a specialist in, in the the modern sense where uh, you go into 
the statistical approach to ecology and everything else. They said, just be a naturalist. Try to understand the animal so that most of my work has been trying to understand the interrelationship between the morphology of the animal and how it re behaves, the animal and its behavior and whatnot. And then incidentally, one of the best ways to get a feeling of what's happening with horseshoe crabs is, is uh, when the water's a little bit warmer in the sun, is lie down on your belly during the time when they're spawning and look at them eyeball and eyeball in the mating groups. And you start doing things like this and you, you get a better appreciation for the animal. And so my forte is, is, is from natural history of the animal and that's why all these little things I've been telling you about is just from observations and then conjectures on, on what the significance may be. It's up to others to prove or disprove the points. <laughs> experts like Dr. Carl Schuster and soon-to-be experts like Caitlin Guzzi will play a pivotal role in raising awareness of the importance of horseshoe crabs and their survival of its species. My name is Caitlin Guzzi. I work here in the biology labs at Brookdale Community College. I also work out at Sandy Hook. It's also an extension of Brookdale College. One of the most important uses we have for the horseshoe crabs is harvesting their blood, which has a compound in it, which we term lumulus amebocyte lacite, which actually has a clotting agent that defends the horseshoe crab against bacteria. So what we can actually do is we bleed these horseshoe crabs, we extract that lysate, and we can treat certain medicines, certain prosthetics, and see if there's any clotting. If there's a clotting, then we know that there might be pathogens in there, there might be bacteria that we need to clean it. If it you know, passes the amebocyte lysate test, then we know it's clean and it's okay for use. So, and most of these horseshoe crabs, when they're bled, you can take about two-thirds of their blood out and have them still remain healthy. They, they give them a waiting period, they usually don't take that much out, and they do wait about 24 hours to let them recoup in the lab before releasing them again. So they can be used as fertilizer, so they used to just carry them away on big trucks, just as many horseshoe crabs as they could fit into a truck for fertilizer. They also use it for bait, I think conch fishermen and um, elver eels, they, they're very attracted to horseshoe crab meat. So one of the things we're trying to cut down on is how much horseshoe crab we actually have to use for that bait. Some people are not willing to use synthetic baits, but they are willing to use maybe a little bit less, and they found out, I think, for a conch fisherman, they found out you, you really needed a quarter of what they were using originally to actually get the same amount of conchs in. The project I was doing was for a research project. It was just studying the effects of different waters on horseshoe crab development. So I took different waters from around Sandy Hook up to New York to try to figure out if there's any problems, any discrepancies in how they developed. And I didn't find out too much. Most of the waters here are are pretty okay for horseshoe crab development, but it was quite an endeavor. I, I had to learn how to find horseshoe crab nests, I had to learn how to raise them, how to take care of them, and I ended up having over 2,000 horseshoe crabs at the end of the summer. With these guys, I'm not looking for any mutations, I'm just trying to raise them, trying to, to figure out how we can raise horseshoe crabs a little bit better. Trying to raise horseshoe crabs in an artificial environment in captivity, I haven't heard of too many places where it's actually worked. And usually it gets to about three years and then the horseshoe crabs start dying. And they're not quite sure why that is. They think it might be a mineral problem. They're not in their natural environment, so that might be a feeding. It could be a problem with what, what they're being fed. So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to keep these guys al alive as long as possible and just try to make some observations to see how we can better raise them. First, I was raising them in these little tiny petri dishes. So for about two months, I had all these horseshoe crabs just swimming around in a petri dish because they're, they're that tiny. And the way I take care of them now is basically to keep them as close to their natural environment as I can. I'm luckily very close to Sandy Hook, so I can go out there and I get Sandy Hook water about every week, every other week. And when I need to change their water, it's basically fresh from the bay, pretty much. Um, in addition to, hopefully, there's going to be some plankton in there that they can eat. In addition to that, I'm going to feed them brineton every day. Every other day, if I can't come in during the weekend, I'll try to make sure I can get here on Saturday or Sunday. But they can go about every other day without a feeding. 
so I try to get them every day. And once they get a little bit older, I'm going to start bringing in some clams, especially like some surf clams that you can find in the shop. I'm not really up for collecting it myself. But the, sur the surf clams, I'll chop them up, I'll put some in there, and hopefully as they get older, they'll start to adapt to that diet as well. And these guys were about a year old. I collected them in June of last year, at the end of June. Okay, it took about two weeks for them to hatch out of their embryos. It took another two weeks for them to shed. This dish has their first sheds, and this has 20 horseshoe crab sheds on there. They're very tiny. After another couple weeks, they went to another shed, and they shed for about a month, every other month, for the first couple months, and now they haven't shed for probably three to five months, some of them. So it's starting to slow down. As they get older and older, they're going to start shedding every year. So it's going to take about a year for them to actually start a new shed. Education is a big, big thing. People are still thinking these horseshoe crabs are dangerous things. They're going to sting you with their tails, which is not the case. So I, I think as long as we start educating the smaller children, which is why I really like working with the camps, with the third graders, the fourth graders, because you can get them while they're young and tell them, these guys are our friends. They help us in so many different ways that we need to take care of them because they're taking care of us in their own special way. Caitlin is just one of the many guest speakers that help to educate children on the importance of horseshoe crabs through the ocean adventure camps on Sandy Hook. These camps give kids the chance to experience horseshoe crabs in their native environment. Activities like seining will introduce children to a plethora of other creatures that share the shallow waters that the horseshoe crab calls home. I think it's called a fiddle crab. Yeah. Yeah. Here we got a shrimp right here. Grass shrimp. Grass shrimp. A pipefish. Crab. Look who came out. Right here, puffer fish. He's puffed. Yeah. Come on, there we go. There we go. Whoa. Whoa. That's a great little fish, isn't it? Here, look at the camera. She's got the puffier cheeks. Puff your cheeks out. Can you imitate that noise? down here and perhaps you guys can can uh, point out anything you've learned about horseshoe this crabs one at a time. Is the these four, if it's a female, these four crabs will all be the same. It's, if it's the male, these will be like punching bags. Some, like these help her dig and bury the eggs that she lays. She has ten eyes. Some can. Like this these like right snail, here are bon snail. barnacles. Yep, barnacles. I think this is a slightly larger slipper snail. Her tail has some like, like bumps almost. Mm -hmm. And these are like her compound eyes. So we were just looking at them in our experience tank and now we're setting them free. Campers will play a series of games, including Hangman, Horseshoe Crab Jeopardy. Um, evolution for four. This is the five horseshoe crabs belong to. And other various word puzzles in order to acquaint themselves with the terms and information about horseshoe crabs and the ecosystem in which they live. Given the tools and information they need, they can better understand the necessity for resource management and conservation of horseshoe crabs.
this is an underwater vehicle that um, ha we have an emergency blow. We have an emergency flotation where if it, the power goes, at, where if there's no more power, it floats to the top. And um, we have the propellers so it can spin around and go left and right and up and down. You might use this out in the ocean for like going down and taking pictures of the bottom of the ocean and like um, exploring down there to see what it's like. They will also participate in many arts and crafts activities. They will learn about the biology of Lemulus by being asked to build their own versions out of man-made materials. Last year I went to the beach with the camp I was at and we found a worship craft camera and I got to pick it up. I thought it was cool how the, when someone was about to attack them, they could use the shell to protect them and the camouflage and how when they flip over they can use their tail to go back the right way. It is important for children to be exposed to horseshoe crabs at an early age so that they can understand just how significant they are to the environment. They are the future hope for the survival of horseshoe crabs. Look through those. We can build a horseshoe crab using uh, human-made parts. <laughs> okay. What do you think? This is because of the tail. Yeah. Hinge for, looks like a door, is like the hinge like right there when they curl their bodies under. Perfect. Perfect. Book gills right like that. But of course they'd be aligned how? Like this, right? Yeah. These, the little parts of the, um, the mouth. Fishy crabs are more related to spiders than they are related to crabs. Very good. Yeah, they're not a true crab. They're sort of thrown in with the spiders and scorpions. Right here, we have all the letters of the alphabet, and for each letter of the alphabet, everyone has to draw a picture of something that has to do with the marine life in uh, one of the boxes. To end their camp experience, campers will enjoy a trip for ice cream. Where would we be without horseshoe crabs? Being the center of a vast food web, the population and survival of many species of shorebirds would be in danger. Fishermen would have to seek alternate ways to catch eel and conch. Doctors and scientists would have to find new ways to test antibiotics making medical advancements a much slower process. Thanks to the efforts of Brookdale Community College's Ocean Institute, the public is now being made aware of the many issues surrounding this prehistoric creature. With proper conservation and resource management, hopefully we can continue living with Limulus in the future. <laughs>